And welcome to the newest show here on KFAR. This is the Saturday Wake Up Call. In the next hour or so, leading up to Patriots Lament, we are going to be talking about some of the very same issues that you hear on Patriots Lament. However, it is its own self-contained show. Keep in mind that you are welcome to participate. A couple of different ways you can do that, of course. One is by calling in to the station, 458-TALK. That's 458-8255. Another way, of course, is by joining us in the chat room, kfar660.com. I'm Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine. My main role here today is to serve as a mediator and to make sure that you get an opportunity to express yourself while also making sure that the message of the sponsors gets through on the radio. Of course, uh, the main sponsor for this hour is Far North Tactical. Aaron Bennett, once again, is working today. He's at an undisclosed location, therefore he will not be able to be here with us. But Far North Tactical, of course, is open for you to go by and check out all week long. If you are looking to arm yourself, this is a great way to do it because they have firearms there, but they also have the accessories that you need for survival and for protecting your family. Check it out for yourself. Everything from the backpacks to the medical supplies to the firearms accessories that you think you might need. In fact, some stuff you may not even know you need until you take a look at it. Head on over there to Fire, Far North Tactical and bring some money. You'll be glad that you did. Also joining me in the studio today from Bighorn Enterprises is uh, Josh Bennett. Good morning, Josh. Good morning, Steve. And also from the Fairbanks Campaign for Liberty this morning, we have Sam Vanderwall. Good morning, Sam. Good morning. All right. Good to have you all here. And at that point, I will turn the microphone over to Josh. Ah, uh, we had our uh, preferential poll this week. Oh, yes, the, the, the Republicans had their preferential yes. presidential poll. I was just thinking about Ron Paul. He uh, did very well here in the interior. Pick some booty. Um, and today is the Republican convention, district conventions here in town. So one, three, four, five, and 38 districts go to the West Mark, I believe it, quarter to one. And District 2, I am not aware of where they're meeting. So, figure it out. <laughs> figure it out. There you go. Now, today they'll be uh, picking the delegates to go to the state convention and there to go on to the national convention. We're hoping plenty of people come down to support... Dr. Paul, um, it was a little disappointing that huh, I was disappointed that he didn't take the state in the preferential poll, but whatever. He took it here. You know, it's interesting that, that you would say that because there was actually a story in the Alaska Dispatch that asked that very exact question. How on earth did Ron Paul lose Alaska? And if you look at some of the questions that that article raised, I mean, it kind of raised my own eyebrows as I'm as I'm reading it. And I do recommend it, it, it just go to alaskadispatch.com and take a look at, and read it for yourself and see all of the different questions that are raised in terms of the party politics, the behind the scenes, the the fact that oh, so much of Ron Paul's support comes from outside the Republican Party and that so many of the Republican Party apparatchiks are so in, in, ensconced in power that the idea that somebody should come in from the I mean, it's the same kind of reaction that you saw against Sarah Palin. From within the from within the the Republican Party. Now, I an interesting thing on uh, last Tuesday was it Tuesday that you had the poll? I think it was Tuesday yeah. Tuesday night. Uh, the reports coming that that that, were, that came out from the Republican Party to the news miner and to the other news outlets was that Ron Paul only got about 30 percent of the vote in, in Fairbanks, and so that's what went to the wire and that's what went uh, out on the reports around. However, the next day I got an email from that actually showed a tally vote by vote and percentage-wise with the actual breakdown. turns out that here in Fairbanks, Ron Paul got 52.5% of the vote. Hmm, imagine that. And I, I'm just kind of curious as to whether or not, if you've got people within the Republican Party who are willing to report that he only got 30% of the vote, even before the the numbers are, are well, the people that were there were saying, no, there's, he, there's no way he only got a third. Yeah, that he he the, we were seeing so many for for Ron Paul. There's no way that it was only thirty percent. Uh, do you think that there's some kind of shenanigans going on in the background? At at, at some point, uh, you start to get suspicious. You know, I'm willing to give benefit of doubt to the media to some point, uh, but at some point you just start to uh, you can't really explain it away for for too long. Because yeah, Ron Paul did very well in the interior. He got it was like 650 votes, and the next closest candidate was somewhere around 300. 
So he gobbled the amount of votes that the other candidates did. So I didn't actually read that uh, release. We'll have to go go and look it up. The media has treated him pretty pretty unfairly this entire election. And at first I was kind of willing to give the media the benefit of the doubt and sort of explain away the headlines that ignored him. But after it happens over and over and over, you uh, start to lose patience with him. And uh, I mean, I've seen polls that were that were uh, tampered with online. I've seen polls that were removed online. Um, even stuff like uh, there was there was some guys who exposed this poll that was online, and they actually messed with the graphics to make like Ron Paul wasn't doing as well as he was doing. So it's either a case of you know malicious, malicious intent or incompetent programming, and either way it's pretty bad. Um, but it's just case after case after case. All these headlines that talk about all the other candidates and they ignore Ron Paul. And it'd be like first place in the straw poll was third place in the straw poll. Well, who was second? You know. They don't even say who was second. Or like in Maine where they uh, canceled. Oh man. Votes or elections in Maine, a couple of counties in Maine because supposedly that might snow. Right. <laughs> Weather concerns. But right. then they said, oh, when we when you recount in a week, it won't apply to the final. The final tally, and of course those those, those uh, counties were heavily biased towards Ron Paul, and he only lost by what, like 300 votes in Maine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's fun. Well, yeah, it's one of the things that you know, people have asked me, and just on a personal level, why why do you think that the Republicans? Is there anything that we can do about this uh, election to make sure that there's you know somebody if if they're actually tampering those numbers that somebody gets held accountable for it? And I have to point out, look, this was an election that was run by the Republican Party. It is a party caucus. That means that the people in power in the party are the ones who are going to basically make the decision about who moves forward. If you want to go out and play the party game and you want to go out and participate in the party, you have to do more than just show up on the day that they're having the vote and expect to make a difference. If you really think that the solution is going to be found through party politics, then you need to get involved and go and meet with the, the the party people all the time. And I don't mean the party people like, hey, let's go have a party. I mean like <laughs> the people within the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. Either way, whichever way you want to go, libertarian, I don't care. If you think that the solution to our country is going to found, be found through party politics, you have to do more than just show up to vote. You have to go out and get involved with the party politics at every level. You have to, you have to have become part of the party leadership if you really want to affect the change. Now, if you don't think that that is going to be the way to to really affect the change in the country, I have to ask you the question, why would you bother voting at all? That's a very good question. It's a fantastic question, even though I did go vote for him. Well, I know you did. You're one of those Ron Publicans who basically just... (laughs) I've been a Republican for four days. (laughs) (laughs) I, I... I of course agree. the the part the political scene is a waste of time. I mean, it's a total waste of time. I uh, I guess mostly on my part it was for fun. I got to go <laughs> vote for Ron Paul, which I love the guy. I can't help it. I love the guy. Might, I might have been your only chance to actually go and vote yeah. for Ron Paul. Yeah. It was. Uh, I didn't get to shake his hand, so I wouldn't have voted for him. So, but it's. I love his ideals, I guess what it is. The, what the guy stands for is fantastic. And the platform he's gotten, the bully pulpit, the little time that he's gotten to speak out for liberty, he's done a really good job. So basically, I support the Republican Party. Nah. Ron Paul, I support his ideals. So. It's it's interesting what you were talking about earlier, Steve, with uh... – I was I was also surprised how poorly uh, Ron Paul did in Alaska. I was for a while I was thinking he might this might be the only state he actually won, uh, based on you know the people I've talked to and the amount of uh, ground support he seems to have. But uh, there was a there's a, he gets a lot of support from independents. Yeah. Exactly. And I think a lot of people didn't realize that you could change your registration, uh, like even the day of, and go vote for him. Um, and some people just didn't want to register uh, I, as a Republican. Like I talked to a couple people at the Wood Center. We had a we had a booth there, um, the day of the poll. Yeah. And oh, I, I'm, I'm pointing at myself. I am, okay. I'm one of those people that I, I was not willing to go and become a Republican even for a day to, 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 to vote for Ron Paul. That's, that's just to me, I, I couldn't cross that line. I couldn't drink couldn't, that. Couldn't hold I, your nose and <laughs> I couldn't do it. I just I couldn't do it. I mean, there are certain things that I will not put in my body. I mean, you can you can give me a nice spread of, you know, calamari, squid. I mean, I've eaten cow intestines. I, I mean, there are all kinds of really fun stuff. But if you put a big plate of cat poo in front of me. I, I don't care how much seasoning you put on it. I don't I don't care. You t- just just hold your nose and take a bite. I'm sorry. 
not going to put it in my body. Can't do it. And and that's kind of the way I feel about uh, party politics. It's not just the Republican Party. I, I want to make sure that people understand. And I'll get uh, you know they'll, they'll, they'll light a bonfire in my honor on on Monday morning on on Problem Corner. I, I'm I'm not simply hanging out the Republicans to dry on this one. And to me, it's it's all party politics. To me, it, you you just holding your nose and voting for something and to become a part of something that you do not inherently agree with. I think you you compromise, or at least I would be compromising. And I do I want to hedge my bets a little bit here. Yeah, I would be compromising my own personal philosophy of life if I did that. And and so that's why I could not do it. As much as I like what Ron Paul stands for, I am not going to throw away my principles, even just to support one person in one poll on on one day. And if that if that makes me, you know, oh Steve, it's your fault. Ron Paul didn't. Well, I don't think so. No, it's not. And it's not even. It doesn't even matter if you won a preferential poll. It doesn't matter if he gets uh, a lot of de- delegates. I mean, like I said, I support the guy. Who, purely based on his philosophy on liberty and uh the pol- political side of it i don't i don't care <laughs> i don't care if he i would actually wish that he would have just ran as an independent but it, it's kind of too. it's kind of a catch-22 for him because if he plays outside of the republican party he gets mar- marginalized even more than he already is right um and, you know he ran as libertarian in 1988 um and i wasn't i wasn't paying attention to politics back then but uh, he, you know, I don't think he got as much support as he's getting now, or even in 2008. So it's kind of a catch too. If he runs as an independent or a libertarian, he'll get completely marginalized from the debates, won't get any press coverage. But if he runs as a Republican, then he loses a lot of his, you know, independent support or support of uh, people like you, Steve, who are just not willing to put up with the the corruption and the games of the party politics. But you know, I think it's it's, it's valid your point that you're just not willing to put up with it because it's compromising your principles. Um, I don't have a problem with that. The problem I have is with people who uh, believe in the system. They believe it works, um, and they support it, but they refuse to vote. You know, I have friends who I talk to about this, and because I, I think the system is completely bankrupt, and I think it doesn't work. I think the incentive structure for democracy doesn't work, just fundamentally on a fundamental level. But I, I argue with my friends. They say, oh, no, it works. It's for the people, by the people. And then they make all these excuses for not going and voting. Mm-hmm. And I'm pretty harsh on my friends in that regard, because if you believe in the system, you, you jolly well better go and vote. <laughs> well, you know, take, take it a step farther, too. I mean, how many people do you know that believe in the system, but then won't go out and vote for the person like Ron Paul that they that they, they I've heard them say, oh, I really I really like what he stands for. But he's unelectable. But he's unelectable. <laughs> therefore, I'm not going to vote for him. I'm not going to throw Here's... my vote away. So what you're really saying is that you don't believe that the system works. Right. Because if the system worked, you could go out and vote for the person that you believed in, and enough of, and and you could convince enough of your friends and neighbors that that would be the person that would most adequately represent your point of view, and he would win. Yes. And, but obviously, you don't believe the system works because you believe that you have to compromise your principles to go out and vote for someone who's electable, somebody who's handsome, somebody who isn't, you know, maybe somebody who's a moderate. Oh, I'm about to go off on Murkowski. Look, look out! Do you let's, see the Do you see the glimmer? Let's, let's let's head that off right now. Do, do you see the gleam in my eye? Okay. Did you see? Okay. Just a question. Yep. You, did, she voted for. She voted with the other Republicans this week uh, against the president's health care thing. Mm-hmm. Started backpedaling that very same day, and now this week there was an article in this morning's paper in which she said, "I really wish I hadn't voted with them." <laughs> She has completely flip-flopped on that as many of the other issues. People think that she's a Republican. Just she, She's a politician. She uh, is a, yeah. That's, she that's is what a, they have a, to do. She's a, quote, moderate. Right, right. Unquote. And, and, and this is what you get when you vote for people that are, quote, electable. Or the unquote. lesser of two evils. They are still evil. They're just less than <laughs> it's whoever. Yeah, yeah, it's sort of like prisoner's dilemma because if you vote on principle and nobody else does – your candidate loses. But if everybody votes in principle, it works. Mm-hmm. But the prisoner's dilemma always ends up towards the least optimal solution because of the way the incentive structure is set up. And and so, you know, it, it just sort of, the system itself doesn't work. But I mean, you know, everybody listening, here's, let me break it down for you. Whenever somebody says a candidate is unelectable, that's only true if people don't vote for them. How it works in a democratic system is if you vote for somebody, they're electable. If you don't vote for them, they're unelectable. Wow. 
<laughs> Democracy 101 right here. <laughs> so wait a minute. You're saying that if you don't vote for that person, they're not going to win? Uh, correct. And so it's oh, wow. So that means uh, assuming they, assuming fair vote counts and uh, no corruption, which is probably not a good assumption, but no, it's not political. Yeah, anytime you're talking about political force, it's not a good assumption at all. And you you had a caller yesterday I thought was interesting. He, he called in and asked about libertarians. Um, oh yes. And he said, well, why don't these libertarians just get together and do this and that? And I I started thinking about that a little myself and one. Of, one of the thoughts I had was libertarians, for the most part, don't believe in <clears throat> political force. I mean, politics is all about getting together <laughs> and forcing your ideas on someone else, right? Yeah. That's all it is. I want so-and-so to win so he can force my point of view on people that don't agree with my point of view. And most of the libertarians I know, they don't believe in that at all. They believe in maybe changing hearts and minds, but they don't believe in forcing political law, political power on people, which politically they're not going to get anywhere. But as Ron Paul spoke about when he came to the uh, Westmark here last Sunday, about changing the hearts and minds, that's where you win. That's what that's what we try to do here on the show: change the hearts and minds. We don't want to force you to do anything. We want to change your mind about things. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to me to see how many people have this somehow this dichotomy, this swiftly treat politics differently than the way that they treat person-to-person relationships. <laughs> As if somehow they're completely unrelated. It, it doesn't really matter that that you're doing something in a political way that you would never do one-on-one. I mean, if you just take it down to the basic level, three people in, in a room, you know, let's say, Sam, you and I have a, a disagreement about something, and I cannot get you to my point of view. Right. You cannot get me to your point of view. What do we do as men? Take Do, a gun and force you. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, obviously you don't. I right, mean, right. Yeah, at some point you just say, you, you look, compromise, you solve. Or, or you just agree to disagree. You, and, to, or, and if you can't, then you go to an arbiter. And no, it, arbiter. We go to Josh. We go to Josh. And as say, in, we agree to buy by your, your ruling because we, we know that you're a fair and just person. Now, what if Josh and I decided we got together that we decided you were wrong? And and the, then, the, the, then I say, hey, okay, why don't we take a vote? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, sorry, Sam. Bang. You lose. We have now voted on it, and you are now bound by our vote. Right. Does that make any sense on a on a, on a even on a three-person scale? If that other person does not agree to a, a part of the vote, if that other person does not agree to go along with the, what you decide, what it basically comes down to is the two of us have decided for you that we're going to force you to do something that you don't want to do. Well, but but that's sort of in a vacuum. Um. So so let's let's take an example then. Um, say I want to murder somebody, and you guys vote and decide that I can't murder somebody. Is that just? Uh, no. Okay. No. The, yeah. That. Now you're you're going off on a in a different tangent. No. No. Here I'm making I'm making a point here because you can't just analyze it in a vacuum. It ha- you have to uh, establish it with property rights. But you're now you're but you're talking about rights and you're talking about the rule of law. You're talking this, which is you're a, separating political law with uh, moral law, common law, there, natural law. There are certain things that we that will never be right, no matter how many vote people voted for it. For instance, murder I think is a great one. I don't think that's ever right. That you can't just get together with some other people and decide that we're going to right, murder but somebody. Why? That's, why? Why? Why is mm-hmm. that wrong? Because it violates the basic common law, the natural law, the moral law, if you will, God's law. Okay. And 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 to me, and I'm sorry, and I don't want to get religious on you because I I don't I mean I don't believe that any particular religion has a monopoly when it comes to the basic rules of human conduct that you don't kill anybody. You don't take what's not yours. You don't lie to people and and promise to do something and then not do it. I think every culture basically has those universal rules, if you will. But my point is that's all based around property rights. Right. Okay. All Um, all rights are inherently property rights because you have a right to your own body. Um, And and anything that you that your time basically is converted into property. So that you're, the property that you own represents the work, the time of your life that put together to acquire that property. Sure, that's uh, yeah, that's a way of looking at it. Okay, and then and slavery would be wrong too because then you're taking away a person's future. Well, it's more that you're controlling their body, um, which is their property, yeah. and you don't have a right to do that. Because I don't I don't think you can actually. We actually had a discussion about this at the book club last night. Can you own labor? And it sort of doesn't make sense to me to say that you can own labor because it's simply an action. You can own like the fruits of your labor. 
right? If you pick some apples and put them in a basket, you can own that. But that's more like the occupy, uh, mm-hmm. occupying or homesteading principle. But labor itself is an action you can't really own. But but the the reason for property is because scarcity, right? So in in a state of nature, um, or just in this universe that we live in, um, all all goods are scarce. There's a limited supply of them. You can't be eating the same apple that I'm eating at the same time, right? So so property rights or well, I guess you could. But that'd be a little, <laughs> and, and me, I don't want to think <laughs> about that. Yeah, a little d- d- a little closer to you, Sam, than I really want to get. D- okay, don't, don't go there. <laughs> but but the point is, uh, property rights or rights are right over scarce resources. I mean, that's the reason for property mm. rights. Yeah, it comes down to do all that you've said that you will do, and do not aggress on someone's right or life or property. That's and and basically that 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 and that takes care of that issue. Of you can't get together and vote right. either to, to to you can't really even get together to vote to say you can't murder somebody because that you don't you shouldn't need you, you don't you need to don't because need to. right right as long as you accept property rights then then uh, somebody has a right to their body and not to be murdered. Shall we check out the phones? Phone four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Winston. Winston, well, good morning. What's on your mind today? Oh, uh, you're speaking about democracy. I heard a quote one time. Uh, democracy is two wolves and a sheep uh, deciding who what's for dinner. Uh, I've, I've heard that too, and I think that that is a, a very adequate way of looking at it. Uh, what if the sheep though has has agreed to take part in the discussion and the vote? He's still sheep. <laughs> and he's still dinner. He's I got. Still dinner. He's still dinner. All right, good enough. Well, okay, let me ask you one other question, though, Winston. How would the sheep protect himself from the wolves getting together to to decide to have a vote? Uh, 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 He he can be in the next county. He can be somewhere else. He can vote with his feet. Vote with his feet. (laughs) Good camouflage. (laughs) <laughs> Big gun don't hurt. <laughs> Big gun. <laughs> Arming the sheep for us. There you go. All right. All right. Thanks. Later. Thanks, Winston. Appreciate the phone call. 458 Talk is the number. If you'd like to call and participate on the, the phone line, that's the old fashioned analog way of doing things. You can also jump in the chat room, which I'm eventually getting here to. Sorry about that. I haven't actually gotten in. I'm telling people to get in the chat room, and I'm not there myself. Okay. Now I'm connected. KFAR660.com. Come on in and uh, sound off right there. We also are streaming live at the website. And uh, take a moment here before we get to the bottom of the hour to give the uh, contact information for this show. It's going to be kind of linked to Patriots Lament, at least yeah, for now, right? for now it is. Um, you guys, you can contact us at patriotslament.blogspot.com. Leave a comment there. Or our email is patriotslament uh, at gmail.com. And, of course, there's the YouTube channel, uh, Radio Free Fairbanks, which is pretty sweet. Yeah, it's nice. You, we, you guys upload everything that we do here so that yeah. even it's, so it's actually it's mirrored. And the one point it's on the it's in the archives at the KFAR website, KFAR660.com, and it's also archived at the Patriots Lament channel at YouTube, which is Radio Free Fairbanks. Yeah. I uh, thought uh, I got an interesting – saw something interesting last night. It was uh, Pat Robertson. <laughs> Mr. Neocon Evangelical has come out to say that the war on drugs, this is really interesting, the war on drugs has failed and it needs to be over with. He's now calling for the legalization of drugs. Of marijuana, of marijuana specifically. Yeah. Yeah. Marijuana. Now, uh, do, you, do you think that's because Pat Robertson has been a closet marijuana smoker all these years? <laughs> or do you think that he is actually engaging logic to see that by somehow trying to force a moral position on the masses, you end up actually creating a bunch of scoff laws who, generally speaking, will not want to obey any law at all because they see all law as arbitrary. Well, he had a good point. He said, how can we tell someone, how can we allow someone to go down and buy alcohol and take it to their home and then tell another person they can't go buy a different substance? And use it. Well, isn't it better than just to go ahead and outlaw alcohol too? I yeah, mean, we you, saw that you, one. Well, we, not only have we seen that, that we still really good. we still see it here in Alaska. Look at all of the villages that are so uh, supposedly dry, or in some cases wet or damp, where <laughs> no, there's there's a whole spectrum out there of, of villages here in Alaska in which in some cases they've completely out, outlawed it. Even the very possession of alcohol in the village would get you thrown in jail. There are some other where you can have it but you can't sell it. There are some others where it you can have it, um, or rather you can drink it, but you can't have it. So basically, I mean, it's one of those it, it, it just different 
layers of interfering with a person's decision about what they want to do and what they want to put in their own body. And when you go down that road, there's really no stopping. It's really a kind of a cool concept, too. If we did get rid of the drug war, the cartels in Mexico are done. The gangs, they're done. I mean, how many things automatically, instantly would disappear? You'd have to let 90% of the people in prison out. Ooh, that would be amazing. The freest country on earth that has the most political prisoners than anywhere else in the world. We'll be right back here on the Saturday Wake Up Call. 458 Talk is the number. And welcome back to the Saturday Morning Wake Up Call right here on KFAR. I'm Steve Floyd. Joining me in the studio today from the Fairbanks Campaign for Liberty is Sam Vanderwall. And from Bighorn Enterprises, we've got uh, Josh Bennett here in the studio as well. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. Uh, you know, we, we've touched on uh, some of the issues here that I think, uh, well, I mean, they're very pertinent because the Republican Party is going through this whole uh, process of trying to find the one person that they want to run against President Obama. And I keep hearing people saying, uh, and I'm, I heard it last night on yet another national show, I think on, on the Dennis Miller show, where, well, you know what, if you, you just have to forget about the individual candidate and just put like a whiteout over the name and think anybody but Obama. And then, it, you know, that that's all we, we just have to focus on that, just anybody but Obama. And I, uh, you know what, that makes me sick. Yeah, choose your fascism. Well, it, it, it's not just, it, it, it's, do you do really, do people, are they so completely blind to see that there is no difference, realistically, between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party? What exactly has President Obama done differently than the Republicans did? Can you tell me? Nothing. Well, people keep blaming him for all of these socialist issues about, like, health care and the... Uh, What's the other one? Oh, the, the finances, the bailouts? Yeah, it was just funny with uh, Newt Gingrich. He supported the uh, individual <coughs> mandate before it was not politically expedient for him to do that. Mm-hmm. And let's see. Mitt Mid- Romney, let's see. Mass- Obamacare came from that. Mm-hmm. Massachusetts, <laughs> Massachusetts, the, the health care that they have there is basically served as the blueprint for what President Obama is blamed for with what they're calling Obamacare. But you got to p- remember... It, it, that did not pass by decree. President Obama didn't wake up and, and write this and say, thus shall it be ever. It was voted upon. The the Congress, both the House of Representatives and the Senate, they all voted to enact this. For people to blame President Obama for that? What are you smoking, man? Yeah, it's pretty... Well, the I think it was mostly... I think all the Republicans supposedly voted against that. But go back to what's the difference in the parties. I like to look at things. I mean, the uh, Obamacare doesn't really bother me so much. I totally don't like it. I'm going to be affected by it. But I look at things like uh, the National Defense Authorization Act that was written by a Republican, yep. that was pushed by Republicans, that was totally passed 93 to 7 or 94 to 6 in the Senate, and it passed by a wide majority by the Republican-held House in the Congress. And I've read blogs and stuff saying, look, at President Obama signed this into law. How dare he? And blah, blah. Yeah, well, your Republicans are the ones that wrote it up. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and you take it back, rewind it a little bit. We, think, we can thank the Republicans and President Bush for the Patriot Act, which in many ways Destroyed. laid the groundwork for what we're seeing with this National Defense Authorization Act and some of these other issues with the... Uh, with the destruction of our Constitution, it was undermined by the Republicans. Don't tell me that it's President Obama's fault. Yeah, I I shudder to think of what it would have been like if McCain won. We'd probably be in total war, world war right now. The guy's a freak show. I mean, look at he wants to go start bombing Syria now. Yep, he's been calling for us to to send American lives into harm's way over Syria. Or to arm the rebellion in Syria, which we f- found out here a couple of weeks ago. It's led by Al Qaeda. These guys are jokes. They're a bunch of jokers, but they're dangerous jokers, unfortunately, because they have political power to pass things like the NDAA and throw you in jail. Now they have a, a bill that's in front of the House right now to take away your citizenship if you're accused of being a 
terrorists. That way they can say, well, we don't have any Americans right. being held in detention. We're not violating your laws. You're not an American anymore. We just We're not violating your rights or whatever. And then you have the latest one. I can't remember what the what the bill number is that they're trying to pass now where they're going to make it illegal to protest anywhere where there's a federal function going on mm-hmm. or anyone that mm-hmm. has uh, secret service protections, it'll be against the law to protest them. Well, it's very dangerous when people actually speak out against the government. I mean, you know that that, that right there, that's tantamount to throwing a Molotov cocktail. I mean, the very fact that you would dare to speak out against the government, I mean, that that whole First Amendment thing, that that's that's a myth. Yeah, that that one's got to go for sure. We've gotten rid of the fourth, fifth, sixth, ninth, and tenth. Oh, just just as food for thought. I mean, you think about it. Do we really have First Amendment protection? No. If you if you speak your mind, you could go to jail right now. We don't even need a new law to come into effect right now. If you say the wrong thing, you could be sued. You could end up going to jail. You could be charged with a hate crime for doing nothing more than expressing your religious point of view. The uh, the Rush Limbo case has been pretty interesting. That's a to, great example. Right. Like, I don't like Rush Limbo, and I don't appreciate what he said, but he has a right to say it. Sure. And there's this uh, lawyer who's trying to sue him for that now, and that's that's an, uh, that's an impingement on his freedom of speech. Should he have said it? No, probably not, but it's his right to say it. Well, and, and, and that's the whole point, too, is that if, if you cannot speak freely, then you do not have freedom of speech. Same amendment, that whole freedom of assembly issue. Try to go out there and have a gathering of people without getting your permit in place first. Zing. Go to jail. Mm-hmm. Well, it's it's the government's property, though, right? Public property is government's property, so don't they get to decide the rules? Wait a minute. I thought we were the government. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we are the government, and it's whatever whatever happens to us, you know what, we deserve it because we are participating in the government. It's just like that whole sheep and the wolves issue. We're a part of the government, and it's the same kind of rationale that is used to justify the slaughter of the Jews. And I, I just want to throw that out there <laughs> because, you know, if, if you think about it, if you are a part of the government, then if it's the government's fault that people are getting thrown in jail, if it's the government, then, then it's really our own fault. Mm-hmm. And therefore, we basically did it to ourselves. <laughs> that's that's true. That's yep. a good point. And you can't be held accountable because the government said to do it, right? Exactly. It's a, you you were just following orders. You were just doing your job. And that's what you, I mean, you keep on hearing these people about the TSA. You can't you can't blame the agents for groping people. They're just doing their job. Yeah. And then unless you are one that likes to read anything, I read the Nuremberg trials. Read. What do you want to read for? You got the TV you can watch it too. You you are held accountable. I mean, that was a really fast... Aaron likes to talk about it a lot. It's a fascinating case. You are accountable for what you do, no matter it, what your orders or, or, are. Only if, higher law. only if you lose. Yeah, yeah. Only if you that. lose. Yeah. I mean, you look at every single one of those people that were on trial in Nuremberg, every single one of the war criminals that was on trial in uh, Tokyo, it, You know, we, we hung the prime minister of yeah. Japan. We hung him. Now, let me ask you this. How many thousands, how many tens of thousands of American civilians did he kill? Oh, zero. Wait. How many tens of thousands of Japanese civilians did our political leaders kill during World War II? Well, a couple times in like two seconds, they killed about 160,000 civilians. But that's all together. Do you, you realize that when we firebombed Tokyo, yeah, we, ki- we killed more people in Tokyo than we did in Nagasaki? With firebombs. The Dresden bombing was the same in thing. In Germany, exactly. Yeah. Oh, okay. But they were evil. Well, they they had it coming. Did, yeah, they deserved it. Did you it. guys see that article? It was maybe a month or two ago where Bush was going to go to Switzerland for some conference, but he ended up not going because some people threatened they're going to arrest him there for war crimes. And charge him for war crimes. Yeah. yeah. And then um, actually Malaysia actually held a trial for Bush in his absentee and uh, convicted him of war crimes. Yeah, just I, a I saw pretty that. gutsy move. <laughs> I saw uh, uh, Leon Panetta, which I think he's Secretary of Defense now. Yeah. Is that what he is? Um, you could basically take any one of those positions and just put it into a hat and stir it around. It doesn't yeah. matter. You, know, you can sit the same people in the same positions over and over again. He was being questioned by uh, Congress this last week, and I forget who was the one questioning him because the guy, he's a Republican, he never worries about the Constitution any other time. I mean, the Constitution is basically a whip that they get to whoever they're pounding on. That's the only time they ever think about it. But Panetta, in the questioning, said that they, the 
president, the executive branch, gets their power to go to war through international law. And this guy was asking him, well, what about the Constitution? And he totally just ignored that question. And he said, well, what about Congress? Con our, I thought the only law that you should be going by is the Constitution, and Congress should uh, declare war, which where were you during the Iraq, Iraq war? And Yeah, he wasn't. Mm -hmm. But the whole point was that Panetta consistently said, we get the right to go to war by political international law. If NATO says we go to war, then we go to war. If the UN says we go to war, we go to war. If we want to bomb Syria, we will get international permissions, and then we'll go to war. And they said, well, what about Congress? And he said, well, we'll tell you. We'll let you know that we're doing it. But we don't have to get your authority to no. do it. Cha-ching. Well, I, I, gee, what, a, what an awful comment. And the people who are, okay, we got all four lines on hold. I, I just want to throw this out there and just kind of chew on it a little bit. Is the declaration of war the same as the authorization of use of force? No. There are an awful lot of Republicans that seem to think so. Yeah, because it's a cop-out for them. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning, caller. This is the Saturday Wake Up Call. Who's this? Hello, I'm hey. Gloria. Good morning, Gloria. What's on your mind today? Well, regarding the NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act, um, I called yesterday to John, Ron, uh, Don Young's office to ask if he had signed it, and they called me back and said, yes, he had, that he had voted against the Patriot Act, and he's very much against that type of thing, and he would have been against this one, but he read whatever it was thoroughly, and uh, we are not uh, uh, liable, you know, in the sense that we've been talking about. But the other thing is, about two weeks ago, there was baggage had some kind of a teleconference thing, and I was called, and so I stayed on. I never did ask, get to ask a question, but somebody else did about that, about the NDAA, <clears throat> and he said that he made sure that there was something in it where we would not be liable. So I asked the Don Young office to please to have him return me the place in the law, you know, written to, to show me where that was and how it was written and so forth. I haven't done that with Beggage yet, but I was planning to. But it's interesting because uh, now there's a question about it now mm -hmm. because everybody thinks one thing, and is it, or are they bluffing us? Or I, I don't think Don Young would lie about it. So uh, maybe we need to rethink and recheck what the law absolutely says. Well, Gloria, remember how they were saying all these things that were not in Obamacare? Yeah. And then it turns out that they were. <clears throat> they just right. hadn't read it thoroughly enough. Mm -hmm. They said the same thing about the Patriot Act. I've I've read the NDAA, and it absolutely says the way that they're getting their cop out is one section in there says that the president is not um, forced. He doesn't have to arrest Americans, but he may arrest Americans. Yeah. That's where they get their little, yeah. where they say, well, you know, we don't have to worry about it. It, doesn't re it says that he doesn't have to do that. We're... If they're not Americans, he's required by the National Defense Authorization Act to arrest them and detain them. The military is. But if they're Americans, he does not have to detain them, but he may. And Sections 1021 and 1022 give the authorization for him to arrest Americans, detain them indefinitely with no, well, not even probable cause if you really get down to it, but no um, trial no uh, due process. That's what I'm looking for. So I, I'm i sure Don Young said that he looked at it carefully and did all this and that. None of them even read, from what I've read, none of them really read all of the bills. And everyone outside of the people that actually voted for it says, says that it authorizes the detention of Americans. So I'm going to go with... Reality, actually, and, and the problem just... is, if you're if you're reading it and you're not a lawyer, it's it, it it's hard to know what it actually means because the way legislation is written, um, there's a lot of terms that you have to understand the historical context, um, otherwise they look vague. Um, so have, have you been to our website? I'm gonna I'm gonna put a post about the NDA on the Patriot uh, PatriotsLament.blogspot.com because I read a really good analysis of the NDA by a lawyer and it was it's like a two-part article and she went into the history 
of the Patriot Act and like the historical context of the NDA bill, and she's really concerned about it. And to me, the biggest uh, worry is that all these constitutional lawyers um, who have studied the historical context are concerned about it, because at best, the NDAA is sort of like a vague document that may give the governments a bunch of powers that it's not supposed to have. Um, at worst, it's it's what we've been talking about, this in, indefinite detention bill where the government arbitrarily gets to decide what is a terrorist, who is a terrorist, and what to do with terrorists. But, you know, um, I'll post some stuff on this on the website and read, read it yourself and make your own decision, you know. Well, I'll probably do it indirectly since I'm not a computer person. <laughs> but uh, I'm glad you're doing it because eventually I'll catch up with it. <laughs> Gloria, I have one more question for you. This is Steve, by the way. Uh, did, did you were you aware of the debate going around around the uh, the Patriots at the Patriot Act back in what was it 2003 when it was passed? Do you remember that? Well, I, I remember that there was a lot of stuff going on and that we were. Uh, well, a lot of the uh, people on the radio, like Hannity and Laura Ingram and so forth, seem to be for it. Like, oh, well, mm-hmm. they're protecting us. Uh, I didn't read it, of course. Well, do you, do, one of the biggest arguments that was made of why we needed it in terms of the protection, it, even though it gave the president and the, the, uh, the, uh, the federal government authority mm-hmm. that, it's nev- that they've never had before, not just authority but power, to go out and and do things against Americans, the, one of the arguments was, well, we can trust this president to do yeah. the right thing. We yeah. need to, we <laughs> need we need to give him the power mm-hmm. because we can trust him. Yeah. Now, Gloria, are, are are you a reader of history at all? Well, uh, yes, I have. Okay, do you recall when Rome, when the Senate of Rome voted <laughs> to give? I mean, is there not a comparison here? I mean, I don't think that you were there, Gloria. However, I mean, from your reading of history, doesn't this sound familiar? This is what the Roman Senate did. Well, anything that the Romans did, uh, yeah, it's questionable. I mean, but that that was the death of the Republic. When, when the Roman Senate gave the power to this one man, this one senator, this and, and made him a Caesar, and gave him the authority to go out and do things on his own, and, and now we see it over and over and over again. It's not just the Patriot Act. It's not just the NDAA. It's over and over and over again. Our elected officials, our senators, and our congressmen keep on taking the authority that the Constitution puts on their shoulders, and they are mm-hmm. delegating it to one man. Yeah, I, I, I think that is very <laughs> dangerous. Also, um, the whole debate over the NDAA was on C-SPAN, and it's now on YouTube. And you can watch it if you're computerly inclined. <laughs> That's not well, a word. I, I but <laughs> if you look at the debate that went on, you have to look at the people that were pushing the NDAA, the guys that wrote it. They absolutely said it gave them the right, the president the right, to arrest American citizens. When uh, Rand Paul questioned John McCain, who wrote the bill, he said, does this authorize the president to arrest Americans indefinitely? He said, well, if you're against the United States of America, I think that's what the people want. So it absolutely authorizes the detention of Americans. I mean, you have to look at the people that wrote it, not just the guys that voted for it. The guys that wrote it flat out said, yes, and this is what we want, and this is what the American people want. So it, I uh, don't trust John McCain, but when he says that about the bill that he wrote, I'm tending to believe you him. You believe him. Yeah. Gloria, thanks so much for the phone call. Appreciate talking to you. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning. Welcome to the wake-up call. Who's this? This is Randy. Good morning, Randy. What's on your mind? Well, you mentioned about uh, Congress's power to declare war, and I just wanted to let you know that there's a very good article on Wikipedia about it. If you Google uh, power to declare war, you'll find that article. And on this article, they list two tables. Uh, one table shows all the times the United States has made a formal declaration of war. You know, that means utilizing the words declare and war in the same sentence somewhere in the declaration. And the other table shows all the times that the United States has authorized military action, you know, without those words declare and war. And um, the uh, first time America formally declared war, with using those terms, was the War of 1812. And the last time America declared war formally using those terms was World War II. But what was interesting in the in the table showing when Congress authorized military force, the first time America, Congress did that was in 1798. 
and that was by uh, the Congress with the President John Adams, the second President of the United States, and that was for the Quasi War, which I had never really heard of before, uh, and that was a war against France, also called the Franco-American War, and um, in that declaration, nowhere do they use the words war or declaration, but they do authorize the use of military force, and it's my feeling that that was a that was a, a certainly a constitutional, constitutionally per, uh, proper and legitimate uh, action that the Congress took, even though it did not use the word declare a war. Why? Because it's authorized in the Constitution. If you look in Article uh, eight, uh, Article One, Section Eight of the Constitution, it says what Congress can do is to declare war, grant letters of mark and reprisal and make rules concerning captures on land and water. And therefore, it's kind of obvious that if you are allowed in your house to open up your spigot, you know, full blast, and someone says, the landlord says you can do that, you can open this up full blast, he doesn't mean that you can only open it up full blast and nothing else. You can keep it shut, you can put a few drips coming out, or halfway, or whatever, you know. In other words, you can have water in your sink. And and what the con what the Constitution says here, in their very brief and eloquent way... Which article is that? Article 1, Section 8. Uh, it, it, you know, they say the Congress has the power to declare war, but obviously it's anything up to that point, and it doesn't specify exactly the language that you have to use when you're declaring war. That's why back in 1798, when we authorized military force against France on the high seas... Hang on, hang on a second, Randy. Sure. Making, making an appeal to history about things that we have done does not necessarily mean that the things that we should have done. Doesn't the Constitution also say specifically that anything that does not granted specifically to the government by this document, the government may not do? Well, it says that uh, any such power is not delegated or reserved to the states and the people. And so how can you say that they have the right to go over, all the way up to the declaration of war by reading from section or, or from uh, point 11 here, section 8, to declare war, grant letters of marque and reprisal, and make rules concerning captures on land and water, to, and then uh, point 12 there to raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years. Uh-huh. I mean, right there, the very fact that we have a standing army is not constitutional, Randy. Well, I guess they have to keep uh, having a National Defense Authorization they Appropriations exactly. Act. Exactly. Uh-huh. That the, the, we have been in a continuous state of war, if you think about it that way, since the beginning of our country, since we've started having a standing army. And look at the uh, differences in the times that we have declared war compared to the times that we've authorized the use of force. Um, take World War II, and you know we could debate about justifications of this or that, of whether we should have gone to war. But the fact is, we declared war, and three years later, a world war was done, over uh, with. Over. And you go after that, you take... From then on, we've had nothing but uh, authorization, police actions, use of force, blah, blah, blah. So what did we get? Korean War, which is still basically a war, yep. hasn't it? We had Vietnam, where we killed 2 million Vietnamese and 60-some thousand Americans were dead. Nothing came good of that, right? We we it, turned tail still, and ran. It still ended up being becoming a We had a the Gulf War. Country. We had... Uh, Grenada. Grenada, right? Panama. We had Afghanistan, we had Iraq, which was a blismal failure. We've had Libya, now we're going to have Syria, and then we're going to have Iran. None of those, well, I'm assuming that's going to happen. But if you look at when we did declare war, we went in there, kicked butt, and got out. Well, we didn't necessarily get yeah, out. Yeah, we still have we, our troops in Japan and right. in Germany. We but finished that's the war, though. Yeah. The same thing, though, did happen in the authorization of to use force in 1798. It was a pretty quick war. It was ended in two years later against France uh, when Napoleon took over. In 1800, uh, uh, John Adams made peace with him, and it was okay. John Adams also signed the uh, Alien and Seditions Act, too, <laughs> yeah. which was completely a violation of the Constitution and mm -hmm. the First Amendment. But. I, You know, Randy, I, I, I love you, brother. I really do. But I, I think that sometimes you look for ways to support your point of view without looking at what the document actually says. Well, I printed out what that... Uh, uh, resolution to uh, authorize force in 1798. I read it. It looks like it's com uh, constitutionally valid, but it does not use the word war or declaration or declare in it anywhere. What, I read makes, it you what, what makes you think that it's constitutionally valid? Because there was never any challenge, and basically just simply ah, logic. Because logic there was never any well, challenge. Can I, can I ask a question? Go ahead, Sam. Just uh -huh. to clarify, you said that Congress authorized this uh, 
this, they use this the force action. against France. Okay, so what's, where's the problem there? Like there, the, yeah, there's no problem. It was well, the, the position that like Ron Paul states against U.S. foreign policies that Congress has to declare it. So whether it's war or a military action, Congress is supposed to declare it. Right? You can call it a war. You can call it an authorization of force. The the problem that we are complaining about is that Congress it hasn't authorized the Iraq War, hasn't authorized the the bombings in Yemen, well, in I, Syria, well, right? I, didn't didn't I thought I I thought Congress did authorize the use of force in Iraq? In yeah, they Iraq. did. Okay, but it wasn't a war, is what you're saying? Now, my, my my point is is that I don't think it's legal. Here's here, Randy. Here's part of my personal problem on this is that uh-huh. when I was in the military, I was an interrogator. Okay, that was my job. As an interrogator, I was bound by not just American law, but by international law that I could not legally interrogate anyone who was not a prisoner of war. The only way that we could have an actual prisoner of war is if there was a declaration of war. Therefore, everything that I did, every single person that I talked to, every single person that I sat in a chair and had them face me at, at, at all times, their feet flat on the floor, everything that I did with them was not classified as an interrogation, but as a, quote, interview. Now, now, everything that we extracted from those people that we used that had military value saved American lives. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind. But I also, I, I have no doubt in my mind that everything that I was doing, I could have personally been held responsible for had we lost and I had been captured and I had been put up on war, cri- war trials because I was a war criminal. Do you, do you see the difference, Randy? Without having the authorization of, and not just the authorization of, yeah, you can go ahead and do what you're doing anyway, but actually having a declaration of war, we are putting every single one of our men and women in, that are currently in harm's way with the bullets, we're also putting them in harm's way for legal ramifications after that use of force is over or if they get captured during the use of it because they're not protected by the declaration of war. Well, that's interesting, the downstream effects that, that rolled down, but uh, I, my, my original point was that it was perfectly constitutional for the 1798 Congress to word their authorization of U.S. force as they did without the the use of the word war or declaration. No, that you, was legal. You, no you're saying it's constitutional and you're yes. saying it's legal because it wasn't challenged. I, but I, yeah, and it's logical. But just because it was, just because it's logical doesn't mean that it's legal, and just because it wasn't challenged doesn't mean that it's constitutional. Brother, I got to let you go. Okay. We're coming up against the break, and we got all our lines on hold. Good morning, caller. This is the wake up call. Who's this? Hey, it's Miles. Miles, you got to go really fast. We're coming up on the break. Okay. Yeah. Well, I just like to mention that even after that. Um, the United States Congress went into Tripoli and and uh, handled the, some pirates there in the early 18th century. And they didn't declare any kind of declaration of war with the Senate. You know, the shores of Tripoli and the song for the Marines. Was was that when Jefferson was president? Yep. Yeah. So he he actually issued letters of mark and reprisal, which is specifically stated in the Constitution. Yeah. So that that's the that's oh, the difference there exactly. Hey, we're we're coming up on the break. Thanks for calling in. If you want to stay with us here, we're coming up on Patriots Lament after the Fox News here on KFAR Local Talk Radio. All right, welcome to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. In the next hour, we're going to be continuing to talk about uh, liberty issues and. Obviously, uh, we, if you've been with us during the 9 o'clock hour, our show Wake Up Call uh, came on before this. And this morning we've been talking a bit about the NDAA and uh, letters of Mark came into uh, the discussion there at the end of the hour. Uh, exactly what is constitutional versus what is legal versus uh, you know, if, if something. Yeah, and I've got a question for you and then we can we can move off into a different topic here. But uh, gentlemen, uh, joining me in the studio, we've got Josh Bennett from uh, Big Horn Enterprises. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. And this morning from the Fairbanks Campaign for Liberty, we have not Dave Giesel. We have Sam uh, <laughs> Vanderwall. Good morning, Sam. Good morning. All right. Now, now, if something is not challenged, does it does it automatically become legal? I, I mean, you think about if an action is taken by the government it, and it's not challenged in court or, or somebody else does not raise an objection to it, does that mean that it is automatically legal? No, and we weren't there either, mm-hmm. so we didn't get to hear the uh, the debate back and forth on whether. You don't mind talking about 1798? Right. No, no, I thought that was for there. Mm-hmm. Against the Franco American War. So, I don't know, that's a good point. But uh, to. Sam and I were talking about this during the break, to put that as an analogy for the Iraq War, uh uh-uh. uh. 
that whole thing was a complete lie. We were told that they had yellow cake and they were getting ready to, they had nuclear weapons, they were building nuclear weapons, they had all these weapons of mass destruction, they were going to attack us at any moment. Al-Qaeda was in there, Al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein were conspiring to attack us and all this. It was, uh uh-oh, a lie. Yeah, now, hang on a second, Josh. It was not necessarily a lie. I, I remember in January of 2003, a good two months before we actually militarily went in, I saw an intelligence estimate from Stratfor.com where people actually physically on the ground saying, hey, we've got movement, we've got truckloads of WMD moving out of Iraq, in Syria. going into Syria. Yeah, I remember and that. Th- this was, I mean, so this was a good couple of months before we actually went in, we know he had the weapons because he used them against his own people, the Kurds. He used them against Iran. I mean, you can you can go and you can look online. You can see the evidence that he had weapons of mass destruction. Well, sure, we gave that them was to not him. the issue exactly. Uh, the, the the issue was is that to to we we couldn't find them afterwards after we invaded, and then people made the assumption that he never had them or he, that that the that it was a lie to go in there. The question is, would that, even if there were weapons of mass destruction, does it get, give us the right to go in there and take them away from them? No. That's the real question, not, not whether that, or not he has them. That's a good point, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and again, to bring it back into the individual territory, if you've got a neighbor that you don't like or that doesn't like you, what would ever give you the right to go over into his house and take away his guns just because you're afraid he might use them on you? Or we'll bring it down to a little more basic, what we get to unfortunately hear about constantly is the wood smoke issue yeah what gives you the right to go in there and say you can't have these chemicals burning in your wood stove basically what they are is it's chemical warfare well with that you have to uh, get into property rights and if your wood smoke burning infringes on somebody else's property rights then maybe you can take them to court sure that's the issue but with with the iraq war um it's it's, steve's point is i think it's, it's a valid one can if, if Iraq is a sovereign nation, are they allowed to possess weapons of mass destruction, right? Especially since the West was the ones who gave it to them. I don't know if it was the U.S. specifically, but I think uh, France and some other countries. And, and, it, and now fast forward to what's going on with Iran. Right. Are it, we not hearing the exact same argument about Iran, about the nuclear yep. program? We have to go in there and prevent them from getting the bomb. So what you have with, with U.S. foreign policy is these cycles so you have the United States supporting, you know, in the Cold War, we supported anybody over Russia because the Russian communists were going to, you know, take away our, our way of living and run over children in the streets with dump trucks or something. And and so we'd support anybody, you know, any brutal dictator instead of the Russians if they displayed some sort of, uh, you know, anti-communistic bent. It didn't matter how horrible of a person they were, we'd support them. But this sort of foreign policy always backfires, and we're seeing the results of that now. Um, you know, so we we supported Saddam Hussein because he was going to be against the Russians, and we supported him um, invading Iran uh, because the the Iranians were friendly with Russia, and, and uh, we were worried about the you know their fundamentalist Islamic um, state that they had created, even though we caused that problem. So all these politicians talking, you know, the saber rattling against the war in Iran, you always hear about the 1979 hostage crisis, and it's absolutely true. You know, these students and uh, Iranian uh, people took U.S. people hostage and held them for 444 days. But you have to look at, you know, the, what what caused that, and you have to go back in history to 1953, and nobody wants to do that. And what happened in 1953 <clears throat> was there was a dem- democratically elected a parliament and president in Iran, and um, they actually were going to nationalize this British oil company, which I don't support um, as long as the British oil company, you know, got their their property legitimately and didn't steal it, then, you know, that's private property rights. But the fact was the Iranian government was going to nationalize it to give it back to the people. And, uh, you know, the, the Brit- democratically elected Iranian the democratically, government. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, and, and then what uh, happened was the British intelligence agencies worked with the CIA um, to put the Shah back in power. He was a dictator. They overthrew the democratically elected government in a coup. It was called uh, Operation Ajax, I believe. And, uh, and then the CIA actually trained... Uh, the Savak, which was a, a military police, a brutal military police that kept the Shah in power and repressed the democratic uh, di- dissidents in Iran for 26 years. And so this 1979 revolution that put the fundamentalists in power was just the blowback. You know, it, it was a direct consequence of this of this foreign policy. And, you know, we've been enemies, quote, with Iran ever since. But we we started, if you want to get into collectivistic terms, we started it back in 1953. No, no, no. Sam, Sam, Sam. Are you telling me that, that somehow the United States should not get involved in the foreign, in, in, in the domestic affairs of other nations? Yes. 
Which uh, Ron Paul actually gave just about that speech in one of the debates when they were um, asked, talking about Iran, and one of the moderators was like, well, you got to look at what about what happened in 1979? Oh, that, was, that was Rick Santorum. Was it? Yeah, he's like, okay. hmm, we've been at war with them since 1979. That's right. Yeah, it was old Ricky. And then uh, Ron Paul said, no, you got to go back to 1953 when we started it. Well, and I, then the blowback. No, no, no. Let's the go back. Let's go back farther. They started it because they're Iranians. Yeah, oh, that's true. they're not Americans. They're automatically at fault. They killed those people in 300. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> the, Persians, the Persians killed the Greeks in the past. Four, five, eight. Talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Welcome to Patriots Lament. Who's this? Hello, this is Charles. Charles, go ahead. What's on your mind? Something from a classical education. Anyone who has a classical education would know the answer of why you do not conquer another country. And the answer is simply you would have to rebuild that country. And you would have to spend your treasure directly to rebuild that country. And the failure of the democracy in the 20th century was demanding reparations from Germany while allowing them to still have their country. It was our duty to go take Germany and rebuild that country, but nobody wanted to do that. They wanted to take money from Germany for all the nana nana stuff that Germany did. Okay. And then, and then, Any response? You talking about World War One, probably then? After World War One? The yes, the, re- the reparations right. from Germany were what led to obviously World War II. Absolutely. Let, let me ask you a question, though. Um, it, it's true, I agree with with the idea that reparations directly led to World War II, and there's and people who... Pre- actually, uh, John Maynard Keynes predicted that the reparations would cause these economic problems, so that's one thing he got right. Um, but w- w- let me ask you a question. What about uh, Germany and um, Japan after World War II? Um, because essentially, a nation built there, didn't we? And they turned out pretty good. So I'm kind of curious what your thought is on that. As the, of the regards the Marshall Plan? Uh, not not just the Marshall Plan, but you're talking about why we shouldn't be nation building, and I, I tend to agree. But something um, people will from the other side will say is, well, we nation built in Germany and Japan after World War II, right? Because we conquered them in World War II, and we we occupied them for a while, and now they're doing great. You know, Germany and Japan are economic powerhouses. I think he said that in the beginning was if you the reason you don't do it is because you must go in and rebuild them which is what we did after World War II, and you're using your treasury to build up another country that you destroyed. Charles, uh, and, and you, yeah. do you read history? All the time. Okay, let me ask you this. From your, from your reading of history, what is the difference between Rome going in and conquering Gaul and creating their own government in Gaul than, than what we did when we went into Gaul, when we went into Germany after World War II? What is the difference? Is can we look at the German and the Japanese and the uh, the, the territory of Guam and the Philippines? Can we and, and even Iran? Can we look at all of these countries as being nothing more than part of the American Empire? And the reason why we have troops there is the same reason that the Romans put troops in their outposts. Uh, my response would be the easiest thing to do is to make Iraq a state. We should have made Iraq a state, just like Japan. We should have made Japan a state. Look at what they did to Alaska. They made Alaska a state. But, I mean, Alaska wasn't heavily populated, (laughs) right? So the problem with making Iraq a state is go talk to some Iraqis and ask them if they want to be part of the United States of America. I'm betting they're going to say no. So if you try to forcibly make Iraq a state... Um, it's going to only, I mean, you're, the, probably the people who, there's, I'm sure there's some portion of the population who do support the United States right now, but you're going to alienate them if you tell them that you're going you're to convert them to Western culture and become part of the United States. That will absolutely not fly. Right. That's how logic gets you to these <laughs> obscure conclusions. The kings and queens knew better. The kings and queens knew better. They conquered, like your neighbor example, if you take your neighbor over, you can't just let that country be empty or let whatever happened there happen there. You have to take control of it. Annex it. Make it a part of your uh, 
part of your empire. So a better solution is just to stay home. <laughs> yeah. No, right. no, no, that's not that's what he's saying right. at all. What he's yes. saying is a better solution is to just be honest and to go out and say, you know what, we're going to take over country X, <laughs> Y, or Z, and then we are going to rule because we're Americans. Well, if you're going to do it, be honest about it, but it's better not to do it. Oh, so we've changed exactly. it from the right of kings to the right of Americans? Well, is that? <laughs> well, democracy missed that point. <laughs> democracy did not come along and say, we're going to use the lessons of the kings and queens. It's democracy is a dreamy little idea that uh, we're going to know better than everybody else. That's progress, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And, you know, <laughs> it... Not only we do we know evolved. better than everyone else, we force you to know that we know better than you. <laughs> yeah, don't we have a duty, though, to export democracy? <laughs> well, you're laughing. That's, that was part of the justification used to going in for, for overthrowing Saddam Hussein, wasn't it? Anybody, uh, anybody who seriously believes that the United States exports democracy hasn't read history. Uh, you won't get taught it in high school history books, but it's all out there. All you have to do well, is go look at the history of the CIA. You know, spend exactly. spend a, a couple days reading a book about it. Go to the library, pick up a book on the history of the CIA. And when I say history, I don't mean like the CIA was founded in <laughs> 1947 by the commission of. I mean like look at the the questionable things the CIA has done, and there's plenty of documented evidence. There's a very large body of scholarly work talking about the history of the CIA, and that will blow your mind. That will open up your mind about uh, the direct consequences of U.S. foreign policy. Because the CIA has essentially been guilty of mass murder and genocide. Um, I've seen estimates as high as the millions. Um, so one historian referred to it as the American Holocaust. One uh, one suggestion for reading is uh, Our Enemy, the State by Albert J. Nock. Oh, good good, good recommendation. I haven't read it. But He's a badass. I like that. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Go you. on the Internet. And read that, and now shut Randy up. But I think you're probably paying Randy just to make it a program. <laughs> no, he does it for free. Thanks for the call, Charles. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? All right, he hung up. Good morning. Who's this? Are you there? Hello. Hello. Who is this? This is Andy. Andy, you're on the air. What's on, on what's on your mind? Yeah, I just wanted to answer your question about the difference between what Rome did when they conquered Gaul and what we did when we went into uh, Germany and uh, uh, Japan, Iraq, whatever. The Roman Empire conquered and taxed the living daylights out of the people they conquered and empowered themselves. We did not do that. Okay, that's the difference. We did not... Or you're saying we did not profit from the countries that we took over? We did not tax the people. They levied a tax on the people, and they, they, uh, you know, took the people's money away from them. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we didn't do that. Okay? What, what's the difference so between taking, it, taking away money? The, I, I understand <laughs> the difference that you're making, but let me ask you a question. What's the difference between taking the money from the people through a tax or taking the resources out from underneath their? their what resources where they did live? we take? Oil? What resources did we take from Japan? What resources did we take from Germany? What resources did we take from Iraq? What resources did we take from Afghanistan? Uh, Afghanistan. We didn't take any. Uh, Maybe, opium, there. Poppy Maybe seeds. we got their heroin uh, inadvertently there's, through... Uh, there's, there's articles about U.S. soldiers protecting poppy fields in Afghanistan, and then all you have to do is look at Iraq. That's not, take it. That's not taking money away. That's not. We're, we didn't bring money into our treasury from those nations. That's the difference. That's all I'm saying. Okay. There is it's, a difference between what it's, Rome it's did and what we've done. But what's what's I guess what's your ultimate point with that? Are you saying that it's okay that we're invading these foreign countries because we're not taxing them, or are you just saying that this is you know a semantic difference? All I did was answer the question. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Thanks for the call. All right. Bye. Uh, four five eight talk is the number if you'd like to call in and participate at uh, Patriots Lament right here. You can also join us online at kfar 660com We're streaming live, and there's the uh, chat room is open and available for you to sound off as well. Yeah, we actually we <laughs> we don't tax the com- countries. We actually spend. Four trillion dollars. Well, to go to war but see, tax. the thing is, we're thinking about it in terms of the government as an entity, mm-hmm. which is a useful metaphor, but it's not actual reality. Actually, the government doesn't exist. The government is only a group, uh, you know, individuals acting, right? <clears throat> so if you study if you study um, Austrian economics, Mises and other Austrian economists talk about how only humans act. I um, mean, this is an important insight. 
collectives don't act, society doesn't act, governments don't act, only individuals act. Um, and it's useful to think about society as, as a collective or government as a collective. You know, say We say the United States invaded, but the United States didn't do anything. Individuals within this government did these actions. So it's, it's useful metaphor, but you have to be careful not to take that too far. So it's true that the United States, uh, quote, as a whole didn't benefit. You know, taxpayers got stuck with the bill for funding these wars through inflation and through taxes. Um, but certain individuals certainly did profit from these wars. You can look at, you know, the, the companies and corporations like Halliburton that are rebuilding and getting all the contracts in Iraq. You can look at the CIA getting money from drugs from the opium fields in Afghanistan. So certain individuals and groups within the government are definitely profiting, even if the United States as a whole, quote, is paying for the war. Right. They're couple, getting their taxes from somewhere else. A couple, couple of action points. I want to just throw these out here to, for people to consider so that you don't feel like you're just sitting here on your hands. Or what can I do? Uh, you got to educate yourself and educate your neighbors on this. Uh, there's a book. Actually, is it a, is it a lecture or is it a book? War is a Racket. But, Butler Smedley? Yeah, yeah Smedley. Um, Smedley. He's, it's, it's like an essay or something. Okay, yeah, you look that up online. Google it. A war is a racket. And you will find that this is something that goes back, uh, well, it goes back a long time. His personal experience as a general was he was involved in the banana wars between 1898 and 1935. That's the minor military intervention that we had in Latin America all the way from 1898 until 1934, in which we... The United States went in and overthrew the dom- the domestic governments, the ones that had been uh, created by the will of the people in those Latin American countries, overthrew them and placed our own dictators in power. For instance, you ever heard of a man by the name of General Sandino mm-hmm. in Nicaragua? That's where we get the term Sandinistas. Years later, decades later, if you're familiar with the Iran-Contra affair, uh, Mr. Sandino our General Sandino, was the dictator that we helped propped up, and then, gee, we ended up fighting his followers some 50 years later. And that is not the only example either. That's that's true. But uh, uh, now, now, here's I just want to, and here's the other action point besides reading that book. I want people to Google today and find out, educate yourself on American military uh, actions, because this is one of those things most people can say, okay, yeah, there was the American Revolutionary War, and then they fast forward to uh, the War of 1812, although they might consider the Barbary Wars in which we went out there. I actually looked up here because I was not aware of any military action in 1798. Turns out there wasn't. It was only fought at sea, and it was between pirates and the United States. This is what Randy was referring to? This is what Randy was referring to, and and what happened with France is that France had made an alliance with the pirates, and so we made this declaration saying... You need to cease and desist, and President, or you know, former President Washington was called back up to become the general in case of invasion by mm-hmm. France. That was it. And then we ended up reaching a, a uh, negotiated solution with France, and they broke off their alliance with the pirates. So this is the kind of thing where it's not taught in the schools because it's dry, boring history. You know, this is the idea of a military intervention. You know, that people don't I don't know. Fighting pirates sounds exciting. It should be, it should <laughs> be taught. Okay, so you got the pirates, you got the Barbary Wars, you got the War of 1812, you got the war with Mexico between 1846 and 1848. Obviously, the Civil War, but after the Civil War, there were the Indian Wars. There was the, and, and the great thing called those wars, it was the Indian massacres, more likely. We went out there and slaughtered a whole bunch of people. We living. were setting them free. All right, there was the Spanish-American War. There was the Philippine-American War, and actually that went from 1899 to 1902. There was the Banana Wars that I already mentioned, the Moro Rebellion between 1899 and 1913 back in the Philippines. There was Mexico between 1910 and 1919. You remember where, uh, what's his name? Um the, the the Mexican Pancho Villa came across the border and killed a bunch of Americans, right? So we went in there, how dare you kill Americans? Now we will kill Mexicans in reprisal. All right, and then there was World War One, obviously, the Russian Revolution. You know we had American troops that went over there to fight the Russians? You know, the, uh, the polar bear expedition? There was, uh, in the 1920s, a, a little bit of a neutrality set in on the United States. Kind of an interesting period. When you say neutrality, you mean isolationist, right? Isolationism. Okay. That's a great just, term, Just isn't getting it? the right term Isolationists. in Isolationists. Yep. You know, you don't want to be an isolationist, do you? What a terrible term. <laughs> then, of course, there's World War II after that, uh, the Korean War, Lebanon crisis in 1958. We sent troops there. Dominican intervention in 1965, the Vietnam War, the Tehran hostage debacle, the Grenada, Beirut. 
mm. Libya, uh, 1986. Remember, we, we dropped some missiles and, and killed some Libyans. Panama, 1989, Persian Gulf 1, Somalia, Haiti, Yugoslavia. Thank you. I spent a year in Bosnia. Wasn't there like a four-year-old girl when we bombed Libya? Yeah, one of uh, one Gaddafi's. of Gaddafi's uh, relatives was was killed, but he, you know he, she was a Libyan, so she had it. She's free. Yeah, she oh. we set her free. I, I mean, you'd think about it and and Google it and uh, and double check it against and, other sources. And, and you're missing all the CIA um, operations. Well, that's not military action. The no. CIA that that's just that's just good old fashioned spycraft. Well, a lot of it was <laughs> it wasn't direct U.S. military um, intervention, but when the CIA funds and trains these armies that go and slaughter civilians. To me, that's just as accountable. So, but but the the difference between that is that we are not sending American servicemen over there into action that they could be held liable for in a court of law afterwards, or if they're caught during the action of it. But I mean, it's obviously the individual spy always takes that that risk. But generally speaking, the spy is working a source who is they're getting to go out and do the dirty work. If, so, you're, if you're talking simply from the perspective of uh, U.S. soldiers being engaged in war crimes, yes, but I'm talking about for, U- United States foreign policy. You can't just look at the military action without examining the history of the CIA, because a lot of this CIA stuff is is where we're getting all this blowback from, why much of the world hates the United States today. They're just not free yet, that's why. Yeah, they were free. <laughs> all right, we are coming up on the Fox News here at the bottom of the hour. 458-TALK is the number. If you'd like to call in and be a part of the show, you can also join us online at KFAR660.com. And remember to check us out online at PatriotsLament.blogspot.com. Welcome back to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. I'm Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine. The uh, folks here today in the studio with us from the Fairbanks Campaign for Liberty We've got Sam Vanderwall. Good morning, Sam. Morning. And from Bighorn Enterprises, we have Josh Bennett. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. All right. Uh, all four lines are on hold. Shall we go back to the phones? Sure. Four five eight talk is a number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Hello, this is Bill. Bill, what's on your mind? Okay. Uh, in the uh, preamble to the Constitution, we find out uh, what the uh, purpose of our uh, military is. And then secondly, uh, we ought to always remember the, the uh, admonition of General Washington or President Washington uh, on his, uh, uh, in his farewell address that we are to, in, to avoid foreign entanglement. And that will give us a lot of guidance as to how to use our military. Do you, do you mind if I read the preamble? Please. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Exactly. And so what we see there is that it's the job of our government, uh, by way of our military, to provide for our defense. It's not to meddle in everything going on the world over. Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Very good. Thanks for the call. Appreciate I mean, you that. You can make the argument, too. When we go overseas and do all these interventionist wars, are we providing for our defense? Or are we making ourselves more vulnerable? No, we're promoting justice. And the general welfare. That's right. right. No, but I mean, you really can. Are yeah. we more safe because we went and bombed Iraq? Are we more safe? Are our securities, are we secure now because Muammar Gaddafi's dead? I, well, you, but but using that same logic, it, it, Josh, you could really say that we are we were not any more safe by going into Vietnam. That, no, that, we that we didn't that that we didn't have any inherent constitutional reason to send troops to Korea. No, we weren't. A, no, we weren't being threatened at all. Well, you are just some kind of a radical, aren't you? Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Welcome to Patriots Lament. Who's this? Hey. Hey, who is this? Lisa. Lisa, go ahead. Um. Now, for instance, if you're walking down a dark alley and you see somebody, um. Maybe somebody has been raped and and uh, mugged and now they're about to slit her throat. Would you like turn your head the other way and go? Oh, I don't think I know her. 
um, keep walking because, um, you know, the Bible says um, that actually if you're a Christian, you, you are your brother's keeper to a certain extent, mm-hmm. and uh, justice is important. And uh, the um, let's say, you know, a Hitler type was taking over Canada and all of our other trading partners and, uh, you know, building some nuclear bombs and missiles. Um, you know, you could just keep your head in the sand and go, oh, well, we're, we're saving some human lives, you know, in our soldiers and a, a bit of our treasury. But um, apparently all these wars that we have been in, which not all of them were good because, of course, it's people acting and people make mistakes. Uh, we have, um, you know, uh, what is it, um, 15% of the, the world's GDP and are the richest country in the world because of that. And so apparently uh, it's been a good thing for our bottom line. And uh, we've got free and open trade with uh, much of the world, and um, that's provided by uh, the stability that our Navy provides, uh, by other countries not being able to, uh, you know, stop that. And um, there's a book by Kagan called The World That America Made. And um, uh, we have been exporting justice to a certain extent uh, within our abilities. And uh, that's why we have good trade and w- in part what's made America rich and um, and other people safe and stable and free and open markets, which are a good thing. Lisa, you, you, you've been kind of all over the place here with the call. I, I want to take you back to the very first point that you made about if I, as an individual, were walking down the street and had just come upon a woman who had been attacked. It, now, for me to say I need to do something to help her or I need to defend her against the person who is attacking is a little bit different than for me saying, you know what, I think um, Josh over there should go and do something to protect her and then going and making Josh do it because isn't that what military force is? We are we are using our sons and daughters, or more more accurately, the sons and daughters of our neighbors, and going and putting their lives at risk according to the whims of our political leaders. Is that true, or is that not true? We are a voluntary army, and let's say you're Do you, a are your old taxes lady. voluntary, Lisa, that pay for that army? Okay, now you're changing the the subject. Let's say that you're a little old lady and Josh is a big burly person. Would Josh say, hey, little old lady grandma of mine, why don't you go and stop that guy from slitting her throat because I just want to hang back and watch because actually I bought my panties in the wrong department. I better check the waistband on them. No, no, what you say is, hey, I want to sit here in my cozy little house and make you go protect that person. Volunteer Army once again. Yeah, they volunteer to defend the United States of America. I know a lot of people that are in the military. None of them volunteered to go to war arbitrarily just because someone wants to send them there. And, and and using that example that you gave of Canada, even if we had treaty conditions with Canada that would require us to send in military force to defend them against an invasion, that to me is a little bit different than going over and interfering in the internal affairs of Canada. If Canada decides to elect Hitler... You know what? Good for them. They made the decision to do that. If they got invaded, that'd be a little bit different than if they elected somebody. And everything that we've talked about, where we have sent troops in, we have talked about some kind of internal issue, where we have gone and we have interfered with the internal machinations of that individual country. And the, the problem is, these political situ- situations tend to be very complicated. And it's easy to think that, oh, you know, there's this bad dictator who is hurting people. All we have to do is go and overthrow him and and save these people. But oftentimes the regimes that come in afterwards are just as bad, if not worse. Um, And and second, I want to push back a little bit against this idea that um, we sort of have this obligation to help everybody in the world because you can't help everybody in the world. And if you want to look at it from an individual perspective, like your example, you know, is there somebody in an alley getting murdered or raped or something? I mean, yeah, as an individual, I feel a moral obligation to help them. But if you take that to its logical extreme, nobody helps everybody that they can. I mean, do you drink coffee, Lisa? No. You don't drink coffee? Do you uh, Do you eat ice cream or any sort of luxury food? What's a luxury food? Uh, I don't probably? know. Wine, beer, uh, cake, cake, something. Anything other than, oh, like, uh, the bare minimum. i to cut that stuff out. Okay, but 
but do you spend more than the bare minimum amount of calories that you need a day to survive? Do I spend? Do you or do, do you do you consume more? Consume like more 14, than more than. Basically, do you well, have more to eat than a handful a day, of rice? Like I've been losing weight, so that I'm, I'm not. I'm not talking about weight. What, what I'm, okay, let me let me make my point. For example, do you spend uh, two dollars a month on something that you could give up easily without you know too much detriment to yourself? Yes, we all do. Okay, you can you can feed a starving child in Africa for two dollars a month, right? Okay, so so, so the direct. Oh, I, that is the question, do I give charity? No, that's not the question. This okay. is not this is not a guilt trip question because we all do it. The point is when you're talking about, oh, we need to be helping these other people, all of us on the margin make these choices not to help these other people. Everybody who is not spending every extra cent to help these starving children in Africa is letting them die. But so, so you can't take the moral high ground and say that, well, we have to help people overseas when we ourselves are letting starving African children die. Every time I buy a $2 coffee... Um, I'm letting a starving African child die on the margin, but we all make these decisions. So to say that we have to help everybody well, in the world, uh, you, I you, reject. I reject your argument. Why? Um, on what grounds? <laughs> because, because. Because you don't like it. Because you can't know. Because you can't uh, guilt trip somebody for living their life. It's, it's, with it's every not other a guilt trip. Starvation. It's, because uh, those are, are political machinations that cause people to starve, and it's it's those people's conscience that will be paying in hell for what they've done to their people. It's, as right. you, so you have, just, you have just you have just made our shoes point. And perfume, uh, you know, so it's like. It's like if if they are standing right beside me, or if I have the power to do something and I don't, that you do. Is when you do have the power to do something. Is, That's my point. On our hands. That's and that is when, and America's military has the power to do this. Okay. Things okay. That okay. Doing. All right. Oh, hold, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. You, you're bringing up a good point. Uh, the United States military. If you want to do the analogy, the United States military does have the power to help other countries. True. Um, you do have the power to help starving African children. I do have the power to help starving African children. Uh, don't okay, tell me you can't spend it. Let's compare our charity. How much do you give? Oh, no. Hey, you know what? You know what? That, that stay with that argument for just a second, Lisa, because I will guarantee you that as a percentage of income, that I do better than you do. But th- but that's not even the point. It that is not a, that, exactly. That is not the point. The point is this: you do not have the right to tell me how to spend my money, and I do not have the right to I'm tell you how to spend to. your money. I'm not trying to. You're telling us that we have Take the responsibility the to send our troops in someplace. Then you are spending my money. Thanks for the yeah. call. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Welcome to Patriots Lament. Who's this? This is Scott. Scott, good morning. What's on your mind? I think I could sum up the underlying problem of everything you talked about in the last hour, forty-five minutes, and. Dominion. That's the one thing that everybody has to give up. We don't have dominion in the first place. We don't have dominion over our neighbor. We can't tell our neighbor what they can burn. We don't have the dominion to vote for somebody to, you know, give them to send somebody to go fight in a war. We don't have dominion. We're not God. We're not king. It's dominion. We don't have the dominion to go start a war with Iran? Because they might no. have a bomb. <laughs> we don't no. have the right to tell them what they can and can't do with their internal government. No. I, you don't have the right to tell me what I can do with my money. No. Why? I have absolutely no dominion, and if I'm trying to impose dominion over you, I'm taking your liberty, and I'm trespassing against you. Dominion and liberty—they're they're polar opposites. Well, obviously, other countries, though, they don't have that same right to property, correct? Because they're brown. They're oh, yeah. Color than us. I mean, I've, read, I've actually heard people very recently talk about, cons- quote-unquote, constitutional rights. And, uh, well, they're not Americans. They're not afforded liberties. Right. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what we do to them in Guantanamo Bay because they're not Americans. Right. Even though the Declaration of Independence said all men are created equal. But that's not our constitution. That's just some other dusty old document. Well, if all men are created equal, then how can one man have dominion over another? Correct. Thanks for the call. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Are you there? Speak now or go. All right. Good morning. Who's this? When your 
argument broke down. You hung oh, up. Lisa, you already called. Thanks. Bye. Four five eight dog. Good morning. Who's this? Hello. Hey, who is this? Yeah, uh, this is John Galt. John Galt. Good to have <laughs> you call. Yeah. Hey, listen, I, I went down looking for that tactical uh, place, tactical. Far, far North Tactical, Eighth and Lacey yeah, downtown. Yeah, you guys, you guys advertise it a lot on the mm-hmm. radio, but I, I, I'll be damned if I could find it. You know, it's in a it's in a one. cabin at the corner of Eighth and Lacey, right downtown. Oh, okay. Cause so I've you, been here for quite a while. I'm I'm pretty familiar with. The you town, me- okay, okay that if you're familiar with the town, you remember where Blondie's is or was? Yeah, that's the same building. Like, yeah, that's the old antique place. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's uh, what used to be Blondie's is now Far North Tactical. Oh, oh, the other the Open other reason I call is you there? Yeah, go ahead. Go I ahead. think you ought to get one of those little egg timers from uh, Walmart for whenever that that woman calls up with that that run on conversation. I mean, you you can probably limit her to a, you can probably boil an egg <laughs> and all that noise, you know. I, and, wow. and, the, the, and the third reason I wanted to call is I really think it's. You know, this is Patriot's Lament. I'm not a real big gun guy or nothing like that. And I am somewhat of a patriot. And I think, you know, you should explore the possibility of having some kind of a discourse with with regards to uh, the power situation in Fairbanks, you know, as far as heating and the Mm -hmm. cost of electricity Mm -hmm. and things like that. And I was going to call and suggest that you have, you know, do a Patriot's Lament thing on, uh, you know, maybe... Build, building a power plant up on the north slope and, uh, you know. We've talked about it in the past, but we usually shy away from that. I'll shy away. We usually don't talk about that stuff because it's pretty well covered all week. Yeah, there's an awful lot of stuff that we talk about. Then, John, John Galt, let me ask you this question here. You as an individual, uh, yeah. how do you get your power to power your house, your business, your car? Uh, pay the uh, GVA people and get uh, fuel oil. Okay, so you pay somebody else to deliver the power to you. The GVA, right. now, are they operating on the open market, or are they operating under a government monopoly on power? Well, obviously, they're all under a somewhat of a government monopoly because, I mean, basically, they, that's they, it all started out that way because there was the idea was to create a monopoly to uh, reduce the cost of power to the individuals. But that, that obviously has been abused systematically over a number of years which enables them to, to maintain a monopoly so when it, you know it should be open for bidding actually okay. you know, but the thing is it costs a lot of money to build a power plant it does in fact yeah now if you if you were to take it though if there were a technology available where say you as an individual could heat your own home or create your own power for your house without having to be on the grid if did, well, would, would someone else have the right to come in and tell you you can't do it Oh, absolutely not. Isn't that the very issue that we're talking about with wood stoves and with uh, coal-burning uh, plants or coal, or coal-burning uh, stoves or whatever the, those are, the uh, furnaces well, exactly, and boilers? Well, exactly. Uh, you know, Alaska is about the size of everything west of the Mississippi, all right, including California and Texas and all that. There's a lot of wood. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a good, you know, good fertile, uh, you know, it's to it's a renewable resource, and, you know, people should be able to burn it, you know. It's, it's creating these uh, Vermont, New Hampshire-type ordinances to uh, prevent people from burning wood in a, in a state the size of Rhode Island. It doesn't really apply to Alaska. You know? Yeah, and I think you, you hit it back when we started with the monopoly part. The reason our energy is so high is because of monopolies, government monopolies. I mean, we should be able to come in here, and anyone that wants to build a power plant should have the market ability to build a power plant. I bet some people would because mm-hmm. prices are pretty good here. Yeah, I think. they are. At least are. every time I pay my power bill, I'm thinking, man, no. if I they, could build a power plant. Thanks for the call. 458-DOG is a number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? this is Tim, how you doing? Tim, good. What's on your mind? Well, about that donation and uh, things like that. Um, well, all donations should, should be anonymous for starters. Uh, how dare somebody you donate and expect a tax um, write-off? Mm-hmm. I involuntarily donate every time I receive a paycheck. This goes to the UN, <laughs> it goes to our local food stamps, welfare, uh, uh, relief. Every time there's a tidal wave someplace, I'm always feeding somebody. No, yeah. And I really don't feel obligated to donate because I already do that, involuntary. 
because of the taxes that are taken and out of I their paycheck. I don't to write that off either. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I do want to say that Lisa's point that the problem people are starving tends to be the political systems. That's correct. I think that's true. But it's the problem is to think that we can go over to this foreign country and just fix the political system and make it magically good like ours, yeah. right? Because ours is good and ours works really well. Um, it, it politics and and foreign co- cultures and countries are really complicated situations. Um, you know, more Americans need to spend some time overseas and talk to foreigners. I grew up in an Asian country. I lived there eight years. And I'll tell you what, uh, they were very nice to recognize me as an individual and as an American, they didn't mind me, but they hated, hated U.S. foreign policy. And that's the same story all over the world. People hate the United States foreign policy because it does. we just go over and we mess up people's countries. Um, and even if the intentions are good, which often they're not, um, often they're, they're just to kowtow to special interests, but even if the intentions are good, you can go overseas and not fix the problem at all. Um, you know, the, the, the going in and nation building is a complex process, and it's not something you should just do cav- cavalier. Um, well, the, and because and the biggest problem when we go across the ocean to help these people, we do it by killing them. <laughs> we kill hundreds of thousands of people. We went to Iraq. Well, we had killed, I mean, it was documented, 500,000 children under the age of 12 or 15 Yeah, that was or just the like sanctions. Mm-hmm. From the sanctions. And our uh, Secretary of State and what? What was, which Secretary of State? I don't know. She which one? Idiot, Condoleezza whatever. Rice? No. It was... Oh, uh, Madeleine Albright? Albright. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When asked if that was worth... worth, If that price was worth it, she said, well, absolutely. She didn't give a crap about the 500,000 little kids that died. Yeah, yeah. Just like we go... I mean, we've killed 150-some thousand Iraqi civilians, a best guesstimate, that, I mean, the official guesstimates or whatever. So how are we helping these people when we're murdering them? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's very confusing uh, being the, the largest giving, donating country in the world. Um, yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll have to talk about foreign aid in the show sometime because well, that's even, an interesting topic. No. Even individually, you look at when um, they have these floods or whatever, uh, tsunamis or whatever, the uh, private sector, they try to raise money. They raise millions and millions and millions of dollars. Oh, oh, the private sector. Every time I from they want to Americans. donate to me... I want to see uh, what the CEOs are making in these private (laughs) sectors, for starters. Uh, I want to see um, uh, what the progress report, uh, you know, what's his name, Uh, Jerry Jerry Lewis on TV? Yeah. Well, uh, I'd like to see the progress report on what MS has done uh, in the last 10 years, and plus the CEOs, those, those, uh, you know, $100,000 paychecks uh, just for the CEOs and uh, you know, I'd like to see all of that before I donate anything there. These guys are living fat on uh, 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 companies that aren't supposed to be making any money, nonprofit organizations. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, some definitely do. Well, right. thank you very much. Thanks. I appreciate the call. You know, I, a lot of this issue, too, if you go back and you look historically speaking, you know, people have used that general welfare clause in the preamble of the Constitution to justify all, all kinds of manner of things that really is not constitutional at all. For instance, uh, going back to hurricane relief, Mm -hmm. all the way back under President Madison, the United States Congress decided that for the sake of the general welfare, they were going to take some of the general treasury and send it earmarked for hurricane relief to uh, one of the states, what was it, Louisiana or uh, Florida, that had been hit by a hurricane here. This is the late 1700s under President Madison, is Mm -hmm. that right? And President Madison vetoed the bill. Because we do not have the right to take away money from one person by force, which is what taxation is, in order to give it to another person, even if it is for charity, even if it is for rebuilding, even if it is for uh, feeding the hungry. We do not have the right to take by force from one to give to another. Yeah, he saw that as a property rights issue. He was Madison was really big on property rights, and that was one of the things. You have the right to your own property. Jefferson said that each man has the right to reap the benefits of what he's of his uh, whatever it is. Anyways, yeah, yeah. his yeah. labor. He said something. He has the yeah. right to keep that. You have the right to keep it. Other people do not have the right to take from you to decide what. I mean, we know that. Now That's look, you have you have the right to decide to give as much of or as little of your income as you want to, for charity. You can Warren Buffett. <laughs> you you can give it away. You can give it all away. You have the right to do that. But the very second you come and you start asking me how much I'm giving away, 
or the very second that you come and you start asking me to give away more, or the very second that you come and you start taking away from me by taxation to give to who you think it should be given to. Right, wrong. that's when we come back to the political force thing. You don't win, you don't get to win, so you don't win your argument with the person face to face or whatever, so what you do is nope. you force them yeah. by law to pay for what you want to happen. Now look across the river from the studio right here. What building do you see over there? I see a big smokestack. Yeah, you, know, you see the Fairbanks North Star Borough building where every single year they give away our taxes to local charities and other nonprofit organizations who are not making enough money from the private individuals out there. In other words, the community out there at large does not think that those organizations are worth getting enough money to keep them open, so they are being supported by force by the use of our taxes to pay for them. Well, that's spreading democracy right ah, there. Right there. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Welcome to Patriots the Mint. Are you there? One more call. Who's this? Hello. Hey, who is this? Oh, this is Randy. Randy. Here. Uh, just commenting on the quasi-war, the Franco-American War of 1798. Uh, it did involve some French Navy ships, not just French privateers. And specifically, if you look at the battle between the USS Constellation versus La Insurgente, uh, the U.S. won that battle and captured the French naval ship and uh, converted it to a U.S. ship. And so, uh, and also the authorization to use force uh, talks about uh, authorizes the military to go after French ships. In right, be- and, and it was and it was specifically why, Randy? Uh, because of uh, France had turned against the United States because we were kind of getting friendly with England, and so they started attacking our merchant ships, privateers, and French ships, and uh, and so the United States did not like that, and so. Hey, I have, I have a suggestion. Um, since we're almost out of time today, why don't you – do you have Internet access? Yes. Why don't you uh, get on the, the website and let's discuss this because I think this is interesting. Okay. Um, why don't we get on this, post post a, a comment or – I don't know. Can, can, can Patriots, people post? Patriots. Yeah, yeah, put a, put a, yeah, put a post on there, and um, I'll get on there and discuss it. Josh will get on. Maybe some other people, yeah, Steve, take, might get on. Take it a little uh, take yeah, it a little Yeah, because it would be interesting to discuss there. that further, yeah. Well, All right. you also, with the use sure. of force with that, I think it's probably pretty specific – um, we were being attacked. Our ships were being attacked, so they authorized protecting those ships. They, I mean, that's probably a stretch to say that mm-hmm. that was an, the same as the authorization of the use of force in Iraq, where we actually invaded a country that was doing nothing mm-hmm. to us. So the the Jay Treaty, which was favorable to Great Britain, angered the French government, which views it as a violation of the 1778 Treaty of Alliance, and then the French privateers began to seize U.S. vessels, which led to an undeclared quasi-war between the two nations. Fought at sea from 1798 to 1800, the United States won a string of victories in the Caribbean. George Washington was called out of retirement to head a provisional army in case of invasion by France. But President John Adams managed to negotiate a truce in which France agreed to terminate the prior alliance and cease its attacks. And that right there comes straight from Wikipedia. Woohoo! Thanks for the call, Randy. We are all just about out of time. Uh, let's give the contact information one more time and review our action points for today. Con- contact. It's uh, email is patriotslament at gmail.com. The website's patriotslament.blogspot.com. YouTube channel is. Radio Free Fairbanks. All right, and our action points today is to uh, get online and look up War is a Racket, that and essay. You a book. Yeah, uh, there's a short, it's like an essay, 30-page essay by Murray Rothbard called Wall Street Banks and American Foreign Policy. Read that. It's only 30 pages. It's Mur- really good. Murray Rothbard? Murray Rothbard, Wall Street Banks and American Foreign I'll Policy. I'll find a link to it and put it on the blog. Perfect. Wonderful. And that takes us to the end of the show.